Welcome back to a Celtic State of Minds weekender. This is a quadruple treble weekend. And I am joined, I'm delighted to be joined by Paul McDagger of uh, Celtic Fans TV. Paul, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I'm good, Paul. Thanks for having me on. Um, before we get into it, I just want to say congratulations and well done to you for hosting this, mate. Um, an absolutely phenomenal weekend, raising an incredible amount of money for, for these wonderful causes. Um, and the money's still climbing as well, so absolutely fantastic. No, you know what? It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a real pleasure, Paul, because I think what happens is you get so kind of engulfed in your own platform, channel, podcast, and um, you're aware of everything else that's going on, and you know the quality that's out there. But um, I think when I started writing down all the different channels and podcasts, I was surprised myself how much talent is out there in the world of Celtic media. So a big up to everybody who's appeared as well. Yeah, it's been pulled together pretty quickly, Paul. So um, it's, it's tremendous to see what everybody brings um, to the table. Yesterday we had the good, the bad and the ugly. And uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say which was which. And uh, obviously today is going off to a really, really good start. And as you say, the, the big thing is that we're raising money constantly. The, you know, the donations are coming in. We've had everything from £5 to £1,000. People are, you know, giving us items to donate. It's been tremendous. It's been not donate, but to, to auction. It's been excellent. And I think that uh, to have it this weekend of all weekends, Paul, this is what we're going to talk to your, your good self about. And by the way, I love the new the new crest which is uh, adorning the top right hand corner of the screen right now uh, the penalty spot in Glasgow are sponsored today's show with Celtic Fans TV I want to talk about Celtic Fans TV before we do anything um, I remember it being launched to talk to us about the birth of this channel that you set up that uh, if you check it out on YouTube it's absolutely huge I well back in 2018 I wanted to start something, um, a podcast, something related to Celtic. Um, there's so many good podcasts, um, so many excellent podcasts like yourself, um, a lot of high quality stuff, high quality content as, as you've touched on when you were talking there. So I wanted to bring something different. Um, the sort of full-time reaction video content outside the stadium was something that it was the only thing I felt that maybe wasn't there in, in terms of the, the Celtic fan media space. So I um, we went and done the, the trailer on the night of the World Cup semi-final between Croatia and England. Um, went back and uploaded it, put it on Twitter, and um, it just it went crazy. Um, I sat down to watch that game and I, I didn't see a minute of it because um, the Twitter notifications were going mental. And then from there, it just it grew so quickly. Um, it's incredible. How quickly it grew in that first um, that first week or so, we we were giving away a a home shot after we, we reached one thousand subscribers, and we reached one thousand subscribers before we'd even done a proper bit of content. Um, so it was it was a remarkable start. Um, the, the first game was against Alaskair, if you remember that Champions League qualifier yeah. that year. Um, and obviously you're nervous, and you think, is anybody even going to want to talk to us? Expecting that there might be a few weeks where you'll be you'll be clubbing together one or two people and and really struggling but it was great um we, we were over the road just over just across the road for, for celtic park um on that first night and this this boy came running over and i thought i kind of recognize him um he said oh i seen you in the paper and stuff like um because it went the, the trailer had went wild on twitter um i think we, we ended up in a few newspapers and stuff and he came over and said i seen it and i just want to say like really glad you're doing this, like well done, good luck and stuff. And I'm saying, I think I recognise you, mate. And it was um, Scott Reid, Scott Reid uh, for Still Game, Method and Mick. Um, and he gave us an interview and he was absolutely brilliant. And then that, that episode ended up doing 30,000 views, which was crazy because we expected the first few months even to be maybe three, 400 views if we were lucky. And we ended up doing 30,000. So it's been remarkable, um, the, the growth of it. So... Um, it's been an incredible journey as well to 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 follow the team and to document it with this content. Um, as I say, this is as in our third year now, but um, we just so happen to be finishing up the second year today, obviously with the Scottish Cup final. So, um, if we can close the first two full seasons of Celtic fans TV with two trebles, then um, I'll be absolutely delighted. 
Absolutely. Just when you mentioned Scott Reid there, it just brought back memories. Um, we sponsor the Celtic Greats team, the, the Excels, that uh, drag you know celebrities in to play these charity games. And um, he was one of the players, Paul. Uh, Scott Reid was one of the players. But I don't know if you've ever met Frank McGarvey, but he's the manager of the team. And let me put it this way, he, he doesn't care who you are. It does not <laughs> care who you are. It will go through you like a ton of bricks. Um, and he constantly calls me fat and unfit. And <laughs> it just it just destroys you. That's the Frank McGarvey diet I've been on. He just guilts you in, not, you know, not eating and fasting. Uh, but yeah, he gave Scott Reed such a hard time. This might, might have been after his appearance on your channel. Um, he gave him such a hard time that Scott refused to come back, as far as I know. So, uh, you know, oh, wow. hopefully, hopefully when we get the games back, we can get Scott back in a Celtic jersey. But um, aye, that was down to the oh. ball. Frank, Frank McGarvey. Um, whose name uh, should be recalled on Scottish Cup final day? Because, of course, Frank scored that incredible. His, hat, his last touch of the ball in a Celtic jersey was the winning goal back in '85. Now, Paul, I'm looking at you, and I know for a fact you were only kicking around in 1985. Would you be right in saying that? Absolutely, I. Um, I was born in '93, so I've not got too, too much recollection of the '85 final, that's for sure. Before I go all Celtic da, which has been one of the podcasts that we've had on already, um, I, I do remember the final because I wasn't at it. I was too young to go because uh, at that time, my dad, um, who went to every game home and away, he also followed Scotland, which is a strange thing now because I couldn't tell the last time he went to a Scotland game. But he was at that game. And uh, the reason I couldn't go was obviously he was there with his mates and my uncles and older cousins, etc. And... In the Ferrari after McGarvey's header, he lost an Adidas Samba. And I, I never think he found, he never found that Samba. He uh, still wears Sambas, actually. Uh, but there, he comes home with one shoe on. So you can imagine the reaction from my mother. I'm a semi drunk or completely pissed <laughs> dad walks in with one shoe on. But that was the 85 <laughs> cup final. We're going to be talking all about today's. And, and one thing that I've really enjoyed uh, over the last you know, 14, 15 hours. It's just the coverage we've had on today's game. People have taken it from all different angles. Uh, we all know the big question is going to be around the team lineup. And then, Paul, you can either sit there with confidence or otherwise. Uh, we'll get into all of that. We've spoken about your channel, but I want to talk about the season so far. It's been mm. an unusual season. Um, and that is before you even talk about the world issues that everybody has been suffering. Um, there's so much to discuss. There's so much to debate. And it goes from the very, very top at Celtic Park right down to the playing, the playing park. So let's start with the players. And, you know, we'll, we've brought in We've brought in six, and I think, um, you know, we actually did a podcast asking the question, uh, you know, is this the best transfer window in living memory? Uh, because I felt it was. I think looking back, you know, with hindsight, it, it's a great thing. Some of the guys you thought were cast iron starters for Celtic have faded away. Some never got started. So in terms of the recruitment, Paul, how frustrating has it been? Because there seems to be some kind of an issue with regards to, Obviously, who identifies the players? Does the manager have the final say? Clearly not. And the involvement or the interference, rather, of the CEO in that whole process to the point where sometimes all of the six were playing too. I mean, how frustrating has that been? We've spent a lot of money this season. I think if you go back to the start of the season, we were all, as you said there, delighted with the transfer business that, that happened before a ball was kicked, if you like. Um, we kept a hold of all of the big players, which was the main thing for for me, for a lot of people, I think. Um, and we, we spent a lot of money. Um, brought in guys like Barkas, a Yeti, permanent transfers for four or five million pounds. Um, Duffy was a high profile signing as well. So we spent money, we kept a hold of the, the big players and I think everyone thought the best transfer window in, in memory, uh, certainly in recent times. So it's been really disappointing to see how it's, how it's played out in this first half of the season. Duffy's really struggled, obviously. Um, I do think his interview last week was was uh, really honest, though. I, I like to see that. Um, showed a lot of humility in his interview last week, talking about his form since he came to the club. Um, Barkas has obviously struggled as well. Ayeti, who's looked good um, in the first few games that he had, it looks like a, a born goal scorer. He struggled with his fitness. And it is a frustration because we haven't been playing to the level that we know that this Celtic team can. So... The fact that those those new guys have come in and very few of them have been able to nail down a, a starting place. 
um, has been really frustrating. I think the first couple of games of the season we looked we looked good. Um, the, the early Champions League qualifier, I think, against Reykjavik, and then um, mm. the opening league game against Hamilton, I thought we looked good. But um, sort of ever since then, we've just we've not reached the levels that that we know that this Celtic team can. And even before we hit that bad run, uh, uh, two wins in twelve, there was plenty of games where anyone who was watching Celtic for, for 90 minutes week in and week out could see that something wasn't quite right and we weren't in very good form because we were scraping a lot of wins um, in the league games particularly against teams in the bottom six you think about the Dundee United game, the St Johnston game um, and I think it was clear for, for early on that the, the forum just just wasn't there and, and something wasn't quite clicking, that's both with the, the existing key players um, and the new guys that came in you're talking about the, you know, the the key players, and I think this season, uh, another frustration for myself watching it from afar is guys that you could rely on in, in the past, Paul, uh, people who were game changers such as Edward. You know, they've not been the same this season, and that's frustrating. And when you're looking at some of the comments being made at uh, the AGM, for example, and yeah, we're suffering because the fans aren't there, we've suffered big time with COVID and injuries, etc. But I mean, how disappointing, for example, um, has the form of Scott Brown, Odson Edward, Callum McGregor even been this season? Because I feel that uh, you bring in these new guys, but as long as your hardcore continue their, their form, then it, it might take a while for the new ones to bed in, but as long as you've got that nucleus of the team still playing, those winners that have been over the course again and again, you'll be fine. But unfortunately, they've been affected as well. I mean, how does that come into your your mind when you're picking a predicted 11 for today in terms of Brown and Eduard, for example? It's been difficult. It's difficult at the best of times trying to pick um, what the team's going to be, but this season it's been so difficult because the manager's changed the personnel so many times. Um, we've changed formation so many times as well. And there's nothing's nothing's really stuck. Nothing's really really worked. Um, I think those big players have been disappointing this season. There's there's no getting away for that. Um, Edward isn't the player that we've seen last season. Although I think recently I, I said this in in the start of the prediction that I did yesterday. I, I don't think he was that bad against Kilmarnock last week. Um, I think his his body language and his attitude is something that doesn't change. I don't think when he's playing well that his body language is really any different, but it just gets times by a hundred when, when things aren't going well. Um, so there's no doubt those guys have been disappointing. I think um, we might come to it later on when we, we talk more about the, the starting 11 that might play today. Mm. I've just got a feeling that, that Scott Brown will play, um, that Scott Brown will start and you can make a, a, a really good case for Scott Brown starting. Um, he's led the club to so many major honours. He's vastly experienced, um, so there's no doubt his form hasn't been there this season, and he is ageing. Um, he's got a lot of mileage at, at, at the age of 35, 36, but um, there's no doubt he's not hit the level of previous seasons this year. Um, ultimately, going back to, to what you were saying about so many key players not performing, I think that's where we all had this debate, and I, I don't want to maybe labour it too much today because we're all... Um, looking forward to, to what could be a massive day for the club and, and getting behind the team and supporting the team. But it, it came back to, to the management team for me. So many players weren't playing well that it just, it, you can't, some of these guys are going away and playing for their national teams and playing really well. So yeah. it can't be that all 15 or 18 of them are coming back to Celtic and it just so happens that they're all in bad form and that's the reason for, for why we weren't playing so well. So I think t to sum it up, last season was really good. Um, a lot of last season was really good, but there was themes last season, um, themes that started last season that have continued into this one, like the performances in the big games, um, the, the Champions League qualifiers, the games against Rangers, um, and those have continued into this season. So in my opinion, I think what we've had is last season was a perfect mix between the stuff that Rodgers had put in place mm -hmm. um, and then the, the early days of Neil Lennon maybe getting us to play forward a little bit quicker um, a higher tempo, more energy. But I think now we're in a sort of no man's land where all of the the standards that Rogers put in place has have worn off. Um and the team have looked a little bit lost at times this season. 
They definitely have. I'm, I'm going to dip in and out of the comments as we go along, Paul, because um, it's a wee bit more difficult when I'm just the guy behind the buttons in the background because you don't want to throw questions at people who aren't prepared for them. But uh, Red Scotland, who has been a great supporter of this uh, weekend, or he's been here, I think, for the whole the whole period. Uh, Sambers were the best football sannies. Yeah, they were. And my old fella still wears them. Um, so a big shout out from our sponsor of today's show, The Penalty Spot, to my old man, Jimmy the Legend. The reason I bring this up, Paul, <clears throat> it's incredible what Celtic can do. And I do remember my old man had uh, cancer a few years back. And the first thing he, he did or wanted to do once he got back on his feet was go to Celtic Park. There's just this magical element about the place that... Um, obviously you miss it and he had missed it for all those months that he was fighting and getting treatment and all that kind of stuff and I just remember him saying I, I need to go to Celtic Park and there wasn't even a game on you know he just had to be there and just kind of stand uh, on the Celtic way and look up and all that kind of stuff and we've missed that that's this season and in a big big way and uh, you know obviously we've had an announcement yesterday that we're going into a lockdown just after Christmas um, next year hopefully we'll be back in the stadium hopefully we'll see Paul outside the ground with his mic uh, looking for people's thoughts and hopefully a lot of them are, are good and positive uh, but a big shout out to the old man absolutely uh, but an interesting uh, point from Jungle Lion where's the leak gone has he been outed and I don't want everything we talk about before we get into the team poll to be negative but I have said a few times that <clears throat> there's been a few issues around players undermining the gaffer uh, this season and although I've criticised Neil Lennon uh, quite a bit I do think that the responsibility is a shared one. So you're looking at things like, you know, Lee Griffiths halfway through December, still not 100% fit. Ball and golly gate, the least said about him, the better. Uh, the team getting leaked, etc., etc. And, you know, I felt, I really did feel for Neil Lennon because these are things that are being added to all the loss of form, all the illness, the lack of fans, a, a group of players bedding in and everything else that's happened. A resurgent Rangers, of course, throw that into the mix. And I was calling it the perfect storm. Do you think we've overcome those major issues? Add, add to that, these agitators that want out Celtic Park. Do you think we've overcome that? I, I don't want to get too um, excited about a couple of results, but uh, green shoots of recovery, perhaps. Aye, I think green shoots of recovery is probably the best way to put it. I think at times in the run, the really bad one that we had, there was times where we thought maybe this is us finding our feet again, and it wasn't like the the game against Aberdeen, certainly the first half of the, the Scottish Cup semi-final. The performance at Fir Park and, and Spells ended up a, a really convincing win, although you could say that, that some of the flaws that have been there all season were on show that day as well. But I don't want to get too carried away, and, and I've been criticised in, in some of my own content for that over the Leo game and the Kilmarnock game. But we have to be aware that ultimately the, the litmus test for Celtic is derbies against Rangers, as you say, the resurgent, um, and the European games. Um, we're, we're in December now, we're, we're out of Europe altogether, we're already out of the League Cup as well and we're, we're behind in the league because of how poorly we've performed so mm -hmm. we have to remember that we can't say we've turned the corner um, based on some better performances at home against the likes of the Kilmarnock um, I've always been of the mind that we have to see a run we have to see a run of six, seven, eight victories in a row um, with better defensive organisation and and a more sort of more more control, if you like, over over the course of ninety minutes. I think a lot of times this season there's been over a good 15, 20 minute spells in games, um, but so often we haven't put together a, a really controlled, dominant ninety minute performance. So I think that we have to see a one of those, um, and obviously we've got the game at Ibrox in in January on the horizon, and we're in such a position now where. I think we have we have to go and win that game. So I don't think we've turned the corner. Um, it has been much better. I think the, the introduction of Sorrow and Turnbull has really helped. Sorrow's covered mm. a lot of ground in midfield. Turnbull's given us a different dynamic, both in open play and for set pieces. So those two have really helped, and there's no doubt we were better against Kilmarnock, but the first half um, was much like a lot of the games before it, and we got the deflection that gave us a breakthrough, and then I thought in the second half we were much, much better, but um, I certainly think we need to see a, a longer run, um, a better performances before we can start to say that we've, we've definitely turned in the corner. That, that's really interesting what you said there because all season I was asking people what, what's the best 
you know, 90 minute performance of the season. And you, you really do have to think, I mean, you mentioned a couple of decent performances earlier on in the season, Paul, but I think the, the, the positive that we took from Lille was it was a good all round performance um, for the whole game. But as you said there, and this is why I'm so cautious, we've seen much of that kind of style of play creeping back in against Kilmanic, you know, particularly in the first half. And you're thinking to yourself, how much of a difference is this than the St. Johnston game or Hibs at Easter Road? It was falling back into that trap where you're thinking, you know, where is the goal coming from? We can't break down the defence. It all starts to get one paced again. So absolutely, I do, I do agree with that. And on the flip side, when we're looking ahead to the, the game at Ibrox, do you think that there are signs that um, perhaps all will not continue as is uh, with regards to uh, our nearest challengers? Because I mentioned it after the Tana Dice game. Again, wasn't getting too excited, but there were signs there. This team can be breached. I mean, one minute they're being called invincibles, etc. And then you think, no, you know what? They could be breached. And then you get the indiscipline of Morelos, which has um, hijacked a couple of their seasons previously, or certainly contributed to it. The defeat at St Mirren. And then yesterday, you know, Motherwell gave us a wee glimmer of hope. Um, I don't, you know, I actually agree with Jackie McNamara. Uh, Jackie McNamara was criticised pretty heavily for saying that they're not that great and I'd probably agree with that I think that they might go on a run we can't uh, hope and pray that that happens and that's how we win the league we need to get our own backyard in order but can you see it Paul can you see that perhaps this Rangers side um, are not as invincible as some would make you believe I can definitely I can definitely see that um, absolutely I think they've been on a really good run I think there's no doubt they've been playing really well. They were going through a, a spell there where they barely even looked like conceding. But that does seem like it's coming to an end, um, obviously with the results in the games this week. Um, there's no doubt they've they've gotten a lot closer to us and, and you can look to, to how we've handled things since um, maybe the start of this treble treble run and, and the gap that was there and, and how you could say maybe we've allowed that to close. Um, but I do think... I mean, football is very, it, it turns so quickly. Um, if you think back to last season, um, the season that, that couldn't be finished because of the pandemic, I think Rangers were on the brink of like protests at their stadium, calling for their manager to go. Um, but then they, they managed to reset in the summer um, and, and they go on a really good run. And all of a sudden, we're the ones who are going through a bad form and, and it flips. I mean, football, particularly supporters, we're so fickle, aren't we? So, it can change very quickly. There's no doubt they will have bad games and, and they could go on a bad one. The, the one thing that I've been saying for for season upon season now is that even though Rangers have improved, certainly in the derbies, we've got a lot of work to do in the derbies. Um, I would like to think when we go to Ibrox in a, a few weeks' time that we're going to have something different in terms of setup and a game plan because we've been second best in the last three derbies now and I think that's that's pretty unacceptable. So they've they've definitely got better in, in the derbies and their European form has been brilliant. But the one thing that you can always say is that they haven't been over the course. They haven't been over the course. And that's why yeah. I was really surprised. I was surprised with their results during the week um, because you do expect the form they're in with the, the teams that were left in the, in the League Cup that, that they would go and close it out and they weren't able to do that. So I think that does show that there's still a, a vulnerability there, certainly mentally, um, because... They're, they're, a, they're a far better team than St Man. They should be beating St Man. So I think mentally there's definitely a doubt there. Um, and I, I hope that that, that, that that can grow as we as we go further and deeper into the season. Mm -hmm. um, again, we shouldn't be relying on that. We, we've got to, to sort our own uh, form out, no doubt about that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that they can definitely be gotten at, put it that way. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Paul. Uh, talking about the cup games in actual fact, and obviously that was part of this 12-game run that Celtic went on, and hopefully that kind of form doesn't continue or return, is, um, you know, Anthony Haggerty was on the show the other day, and he made a, a really good point, actually, because you get so engulfed and so focused on your own team that, you know, do I think about Livingston, St. Johnston, Hibs and St. Mirren? Not a great deal unless we're playing them. Uh, and what he said was, it's a real shame if that final happens between 
two of those four clubs and the fans of those clubs aren't able to attend because obviously it's not often Livingston get to a final or St. Johnston, uh, St. Mirren and of course uh, Hibs have had some success in the, the kind of modern game but yeah absolutely and then it made me wonder well when I'm looking at those those teams who they are fancy I think Hibs are, are obviously favourites for a good reason and then it begs the question about the manager because I know that Jack Ross has been linked to the Celtic job he was even questioned about it, which I found quite surprising. He certainly appeared on the odd sheet. Um, and as much as I like Jack Ross, Paul, I don't think that's the answer. And I've been thinking a hell of a lot about this because I made my feelings known about Neil Lennon. And um, I was always in the Lennon camp. And, you know, I still love Neil Lennon. He's still an icon to me. He's still a club legend. Of course he is. But is there another role for Neil Lennon? Is there another role at Celtic Park for Neil Lennon? And has this terrible form um, almost come in just that wee bit too soon? Was was there a plan in place whereby, you know, I always feel that there's a there's a space that between the manager and you know Peter Lowell, there's a space in there, and at the moment it's occupied by Nicky Hammond. And I remember Lowell's famous quote or infamous quote about he knows the city and he knows a player, but no one can deny Neil Lennon does know a player. Um, and although I criticise him about development of players, what he does do if someone isn't playing well is he identifies someone who can step in and he's done it, uh, you know, first and second term, absolutely. Is there is there a situation where, you know, should we get this back on track? Um, there might have been a, a plan in place for Neil Lennon to move into that gap where he's a buffer between the manager because he knows the, the issues that this current structure can cause and Peter Lowell, who, again, is the cause of some of the issues? I think there could be. Um, I think there there could potentially be that that space there, that in, in Neil Lennon could fill it. I, I don't see how he would go from being the manager um, straight into that position, though. Um, I don't know in terms of his stature, maybe his own his own personal pride, if he could go from being the manager to taking a step back, if you like, because um, obviously the Celtic manager is the most important. Um, person at the club in my opinion so I don't know if Neil Lennon would want to go from that position to maybe taking a backwards steps and, and being a buffer between whether it's the recruitment team and the management team or um, the management team and the board whatever it may be I, I think undoubtedly Celtic have to look at the structure of the football club we haven't uh, touched on the board yet you talked about um, shared responsibility earlier on there and I think the board take most of the, the responsibility for me. Um, thinking back to that treble treble final, we were all elated, but not expecting an announcement on the permanent manager so soon afterwards. Um, I think the manner that they done that, and regardless of whether you think Neil Lennon was the absolute best manager for Celtic to take us forward or not, um, the, man, the manner that that was done in um, didn't help anyone. So I think... The board have got a lot of responsibility to take. There's no doubt. We know they, they spent money this summer, but then, as we, we said at the top of this show, some of the some of the signings haven't worked out so far. Um, I think it all points to the board's the fact that the football structure of the club has to be better. Mm -hmm. Potentially, has to be more modern. Um, and I, I've said since the, the beginning of this season that whether we win ten in a row or not, I would like to see changes at the club. Um, there's no doubt we'll, we'll probably go through a transition at the end of this season, regardless of what happens, um, with, with some big players' contracts running down and and stuff like that. So I would definitely like to see some sort of change. I think we would we have to get to a more modern structure, um, and and look at the recruitment as as a main part of that, and and have a, a structured way of signing players that doesn't change. And if we're going to go through a transition, we might have to accept that for a season or two. We won't be at the levels that we've been at recently. Um, mm -hmm. But if it helps us get to where we want to be in the long run and get back to where Celtic should be in, in the context of European football, um, because I think the regression in European terms in, in recent seasons has been so stark um, and we need to address that as quickly as possible. And I think that comes back to, to the, the football structure at the club and um, I think we need to change it. Oh, definitely. I mean, yes, it all leads to the, the board question, the question of of the board. And obviously, I follow you on, on Twitter as well, Paul. So I get a sense of your feelings around all the different aspects of the club that are not working at the moment. Um, I just feel that, and again, I spoke about this at the very uh, beginning of today's shows. I feel that uh, when we uh, have this communication from the board, 
um, and obviously the latest one has been the AGM. I, I don't feel as though they we're speaking the same language. Now, Stevie uh, Mullen made a great point last week in that the board can't tell you exactly how it is. Or you might have a Ratner's moment where the share, the share price falls through the roof, uh, <laughs> down the pan rather. And I get that, I totally get that. But I don't think that the manner in which we're spoken to or spoken at um, makes me um, feel connected to this board, the current, the current structure, the current board that we have um, at the helm. Now, we talk about communications. You're able to set up a communications channel um, which goes out to tens of thousands of Celtic fans, but yet I don't think we have that same engagement with the club. What's your thoughts on, even through the, the pandemic, where the perfect, you know, the perfect opportunity was there for the club to really engage with the fans? Now, we, I'm not even going to say tongue-in-cheek, but we, we asked Peter Lowell for an interview. I, I first asked him for an interview about two or three years ago, I think it was. Uh, so we've been chasing it for some time. Whether or not it ever happens, Paul, if it does, you're welcome to join me on that Zoom call. Um, I don't think I don't think they'll allow us to record it. Who knows? Um, but I mean, what's the key? So, so what's some of the questions you would ask Peter Lowell in, in relation to you've you hit the nail on the head with the European regression? Absolutely. Um, do we know what Celtic's plan is over the next five years? And if not, why? Um, I just don't think the communications there. What kind of things would you like to ask Peter Lowell? Hmm. That's that's a good question, and and you make a great point in terms of the communication for the club because I think it's been terrible i think it's been really poor um particularly since the pandemic i know that in the agm video peter lobel was really defensive about the, communic the communication and he thinks it's he thinks it's fine he thinks it's really good actually um which might tell you as much as you need to know um there's there's so many questions i think <laughs> the, the first one i would ask him is what what has the club done in the past three seasons to get closer to the champions league group stage what changes have been made um, because it seems to me like we've made the same mistake for three seasons in a row now. Um, we've been, okay, we know the first one was maybe a bit of infighting between the board and, and Rodgers about the transfer of John McGinn and, and whatever it might have been. The, the, the last two seasons, particularly under Neil Lennon, um, we've lost in, in the qualifying rounds to clubs that are a tenth of the size of Celtic. There's mm. absolutely no getting away for that. And okay, it's football. We know that can happen. It can happen once, um, but we're now in a run of three years in a row where we haven't got anywhere near the Champions League. Um, and that, to me, is the yardstick for Celtic. I think if the, the board seen the progress that was made under Brendan Rodgers for all of, for all of Rodgers' um, faults in the end, he was an excellent coach and he did take us to the group stages twice. And the board must have seen and the, the even the share price, right down to the share price, the share price. Um, just about doubled but since mm. before Brendan Rodgers came into it to where it was at Celtic's height while Rodgers was here. So I think to to make such a whimper of an attempt at making the Champions League group stages the past couple of seasons has been unacceptable, really. Um, so that would be the main question for me. What what have we done behind the scenes to, to get us to the, the Champions League group stages? Because nothing in the past three seasons. We're, we're getting further away. We're not getting closer. Mm -hmm. so what have we done um, I don't know if he, he would tell me that Nicky Hammond came in um, so that was something different that they'd done if they brought in um, new data software whatever it might be um, but I think at the end of the day we're getting further and further away from the, the, the Champions League group stages and we might not be able to compete um, with the elite clubs in Europe we know that but um, you can see in the teams that have eliminated in the Champions League I think they've all went into the group stages and I think between them they've gathered about two points over three seasons. So there's no doubt that we should be much, much better um, in a European context and um, that is something that I think the board haven't done enough mm -hmm. um, to, to improve on. No, you're you're spot on. Now we do have a question coming in in relation to the uh, fabled interview with, with Peter Lowell. Yes, um, I think that as well, Richard, but... Uh, I won't confirm it until it happens. I won't believe it until it happens. But uh, it would be great if the club were able to uh, arrange that because we have had communications with them over the last few weeks and we will be revisiting that in January. Uh, talking of which, there'll be another review in January, Paul, and that review will be the board reviewing the situation with the manager. And, you know, although 
my tipping point was half time at Pataudry. Um We've been told that Lenny's going to be the gaffer right up potentially to the Ibrox uh, encounter. Uh, today may add to us getting our season back on track or it, it may completely derail it. Where do you stand on Neil Lennon as Celtic manager at the moment? I think we, we still, certainly in my opinion, I, I would like to see a change in manager. I think Neil Lennon is fortunate to still be here. There, there's no getting away for that. Um, we did go through a, a, a run of two wins in 12 games and a few people pointed out to me that if you look at that run, there's not a lot of domestic league games in there and there was a lot of European games, but I think the manner that we lost some of those games in um, was unacceptable and it, it seemed unachievable to me. So I think um, he's certainly fortunate to still be in the job. I, I don't know. I think hopefully that we get the, the win today and it does give us a shot in the arm and we can really go forward and, and push on. I'm not sure what that will do and and like when we come to January I don't know if they plan on reviewing it straight after Ibrox mm. or if they want to wait a, a wee bit longer but I think ultimately for me it comes down to that game at Ibrox there's there's no two ways about that if if we win all our games up until Ibrox and and so do Rangers if we lose at Ibrox the manager has to change that like it'll be we'll be right on the cusp of losing the title there and then um, if, if we get beaten in January. So I don't know where we'll be at that point. As you say, there's there's maybe three, four games to go up until then. And today is obviously a big opportunity for us to to make more history. Um, so that might help Neil Lennon. It'll certainly help the team if we can win it. Um, but it all comes down to that game at Ibrox for me. Mm, yeah, absolutely, Paul. Now, you'll be covering today's game. So before we get into uh, predicted team lines, etc., I'm um, hearing that there's some leaked teams filtering into Twitter. I'm not going to get involved in the leaked teams. Uh, it's always a bad I- idea on the eve of any big game. So what, what coverage are you uh, planning for today's cup final, Paul, on Celtic Fans TV? We've got live full-time reactions straight after the game. Um, Four-man panel today, uh, as opposed to the usual three, just something wee bit extra um, four contributors on instead of the usual three just because it's a cup final and and hopefully we can all be in, in celebratory mood after that mm. um, that will be live uh, on YouTube and then I'll have the usual Twitter reactions uh, after the game as well so hopefully um, I'll be able to have a few beers and, and celebrate while making that content just to let everybody know, I'm not on the beers because uh, that is that is water, fizzy water. Be but, um, I've been accused a few times of being drinking beer at 12.30 in the afternoon on a Tuesday and stuff like that, Paul. So just to get that one out there. Um, now, a good point made by Stephen McGonigal on YouTube. Hi, guys. Good to see two great podcasts together. Uh, what I would say is that um, although it wasn't planned months and months in advance, I think having a a charity weekender, um, allowing all the different Celtic platforms to come together for a weekender, I think is a great thing. Um, now, the 20 or so podcasts this time next year might be different uh, because some of them come and go, Paul. I mean, even yesterday, one of them came out of retirement just to appear on the show. Um, but, you know, if there's an appetite for it, and we will we'll gauge that uh, nearer the time, I, I think it would be great once a year to do this and bring the talent that the Celtic support has at its disposal in terms of alternative media. Some might call it rebel media. Um, it's been called a, a lot worse than that as well. Um, but, yeah, I think there's so many people out there doing a great job and why not you know it's been a great success and I did up up uh, date the the ticker tape whilst you were talking earlier Paul so at the moment when we're putting the fundraising page and also the auctions together we're at 18 and a half grand now that, that's just tremendous um our total uh, our target rather is 25 grand today um, and I think that uh, there's a there's a chance we'll get to that. Now, you might know this yourself, Paul. Bizarrely enough, our figures are higher when Celtic uh, have had a bad result uh, because a lot of fans want to come on and vent, and that's what we notice. I'm hoping the figures are high after today, but not for that reason. I'm hoping everybody realises just the, the significance, the historical significance of what today could bring. Um, it's, it's unbelievable to imagine four trebles in a row in any domestic league anywhere in the world, and we're on the cusp of that today. And we're within touching distance of making that history. 
And you know, when you're growing up, I always remember watching the old Celtic centenary video, and this old fella, I think he was the the kind of Paul the Tim of his day. He was called Celtic's greatest supporter. I don't know who it was actually. Somebody who's tuning in might might have known the old guy, and his dream was to do another nine in a row. Now, by, t- by the time the centenary video came out, Paul, it was Christmas 1988, which means we had already embarked upon the pretty forgettable season that was 88-89. And in that season, Rangers beat us 5-1, 4-1. We were terrible in the league. We won the Scottish Cup to prevent them from winning the treble. But I remember watching that around about that Christmas and thinking, Celtic, nine in a row, are you kidding me? That will never happen. And that was me in 1988. But I've seen it. And that that's just incredible to have witnessed that. And I never take that for granted because I know in my lifetime it won't happen again. The likelihood it happening again is slim to none. So we are living in, in very special blessed times. And I think that Celtic fans are not entitled. I think that they've got high demands. And I think they're appreciative of where we are and how we got there and how difficult it was to get there. And it was done with all the bills being paid, uh, with everything being done in the right manner. Uh, and we never ever want to get back to the, the dark old days of the 1990s. That's me going back into my Celtic da mode, Paul, uh, that I came on in. So when we're looking at today's team, then the team that might make history, um, I would be interested to know how you would line up. I think he's going to go with Hazard and goals. I think it'll be a back four at Ayer, Julian, Duffy. I went with Taylor in my starting 11 prediction. That was a toss of a coin. I could, I could mm. definitely see Laxall starting. Um, I think it will be Brown and McGregor. Turnbull in front of them. Christie on the right-hand side. El Yunusu on the left-hand side. And Edward to lead the line. That's mm. the team I think he'll go with. Well, it's very similar um, to the team that I think he'll go with. Absolutely, 100%. Um, I've stood up time and time again for Christie. I'm just writing this down here. Um, because I'm a big fan of Christie. But I see a lot of Celtic fans who criticise him and I, and I know why that is. But of the team that you've mentioned there, there is a couple where, you know, if he was to pick Laxalt for Taylor, for example, it wouldn't surprise me a great deal. And it wouldn't concern me a massive deal either. Uh, the other one, I think, looking at that side that he might might do something with is El Yunusi. Another player who on his on his day is, is a game changer. We've seen it in the semi-final against Aberdeen. Um, but that, I think, is the area of the pitch that he might tinker with. Uh, I do believe that he's going to start with Brown. Um, I would be more concerned if Turnbull wasn't in the starting line lineup than Sorrow, although I think Sorrow's made a really, really big impact. And I hope that Hazard does start because there comes a point, Paul, where, you know, Tierney needed games before we, we've seen Kieran Tierney. McGregor needed those games. He didn't get them first time round under Lenny. Made his debut, of course, under Ronnie Dyla. So, you know, Hazard needs those games. Um, I mean, he's been coached by for me, one of the best goalie coaches there is in the game, Stevie Woods. And, and again, Stevie Woods knows Craig Gordon so, so well, and that's going to be good for us. That's an advantage. Hazard actually reminds me of Gordon, a younger Gordon, uh, even just his stature and his ath- athleticism, shop stopping. He looks like that type of goalie. Um, but let's talk about Turnbull, because there's a guy there who, you know, we thought we had him uh, a year before we did get him. We kept that that charge up. We kept uh, searching for him through that terrible period of recovery for David Turnbull. He is, for me, the you know the best prospect in Scottish football. But he'll only be a prospect unless he gets games. He's had a couple of games and he's looked really, really impressive. Um, we've not seen him for a, a lengthy spell, I'm thinking back to the St. Johnson game at McDermott, where him and maybe Christie have been firing on all cylinders. I think that would be a prospect and a half. But how impressed have you been with Turnbull, particularly since he's come back in over the last couple of games? Massively. I have been really impressed with him. I think he's got that sort of Tom Rogic, if you like, he plays on a half turn. Um, he's, his passing range is brilliant. Um, his set pieces, as I, uh, I mentioned earlier, I think his set pieces give us a really different dynamic. We've, we've really struggled with set piece delivery this season and in recent seasons, you might say as well. So, um, his free kick and corner delivery has been brilliant, um, and he's just been he's just been so positive. He's it looks like he's his energy and his his um, creativity he's sort of jolted the team into a much better uh, much better performances recently. Sorry, so I have been really impressed with him. I think he's the, probably the player in the team that you can't drop today you can't not play um we've obviously struggled for as we've said uh, earlier on in the video players to be in really good form 
where they're in the team week in and week out. We've not had enough of them this season. But I think right now, Turnbull is, is as close as we've got to that. Mm -hmm. um, someone that's playing really well. Um, as a, a constant threat for us, every time he gets the ball, something might happen. And that's the kind of players we want to see. And I think he's the only one right now in the team who you would say, and I know it's just based on, on two starts, which, which isn't a, a huge one of games, but um, I think he's brought enough to the team in those two games uh, to the point where you have to start him today. The other big one I've seen all week, Paul, you might have had the same uh, whilst doing your content is the question around Edward and people on the one hand are saying, and I'm one of them, you know, pick players on form, pick Hazard on form and Turnbull and I've also said Sorrow on form and I get that that would be bold because that would mean that you leave out uh, the captain of the club. Um, on the flip side, Edward's not in great form but I still pick him so I'm just a walking contradiction. What's your thoughts on Edward and and um, what, what Edward are we going to get today? If he is picked, which I think he will be. I hope we get the Edward from the 2019 final. We know he's a big game player. Um, he loves these big occasions. And throughout this run, there has been games where he's not played well at all. But there has been games where I mean, he scored an excellent goal away against Prague before, obviously, the team capitulated. Um, he scored a very good goal in Milan as well. So there's no doubt, we all know his quality. He's got those sort of performances in him, like we've seen in the, the Cup Final 2019. I just think, who do you play if you don't play? Edward Klamala, because Ayeti and Griffiths have been nowhere near it the past few weeks. Um, and Klamala, certainly for me, I know he's, he's come on and he's, he's scored a few goals off the bench in the league this season. But I, I just can't see why you would, you would start this game with Klamala. I think Edward's got all the quality and more. We know we haven't seen it enough this season. But there's no doubt that he can be the match winner. And it's a cup final. As I say, he's a big game player. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if he was a match winner for us again today and he brought a really high level of performance because um, we've seen it so many times before. Yeah, we have. And you mentioned a, a final that, you know, you, you refer to it as maybe last year's. It doesn't certainly feel like last season's because that's today's. You know, it can get confusing. But I, do, I remember the, the final touch of the ball. We spoke about McGarvey's last touch of a ball in a Celtic jersey, winning us the Scottish Cup in 85. Lustig's last touch in a Celtic jersey again was a header. And he knew, and everybody in the stadium knew that uh, when that fell to Edward, he was going to finish it. He's the one guy you wanted that ball to fall um, for in a situation like that. And similarly, against Milan and the, the goal that you mentioned, no one else in the pitch could have scored that goal, Paul. You know, it, he's got that class. He's got, And yeah, he's been playing within himself. A lot of people are saying that he's surly and he's huffy and he wants away. Perhaps he does, and that, that's maybe contributed to his, his poor form, particularly when you see what he's doing for the France under-21 team. Uh, but I do think that he's a big game player. Um, he's proved that time and time again. He'll be up for it today. He knows that, yeah, it's a National Cup final, and it will be covered um, further than Scotland and, and uh, even Britain, so he'll be able to put on a performance. Um, I do think he wants to get away probably sooner than we would like, but you know, the flip side of that is he stayed longer than Dembele has stayed. So mm. Celtic promises guys a platform um, and there comes a point in their development where they want away. Ten in a row means everything to guys like you and me. How much does it mean to Eddie, you know, beyond the professionalism of wanting to win? Certainly not as much as it does to guys like us and everyone else who's tuning in. Uh, but I will ask another question about the selections um, and I'm just waiting for that league team to come in. But uh, Mark who has been very supportive throughout this charity weekend. So welcome back, Mark. You're commenting on YouTube. Any curveball selections today? We know that Lenny has it in him. Um, you've given us our team and I don't think there's any curveballs in there. If he was to throw one in, who do you think it may be, Paul? It's hard to say. I mean, who, who has a curveball right now? Because um, as I said earlier, we've saw so many um, different team selections this season. Um Turnbull, as I say, I think has to start. Maybe we could see Vogic in there. Um, I don't know how much of a curveball that is, though, because he's been excellent um, for Celtic, and particularly in these big games at Hamden, as we know. So, I mean, Kamala would be a curveball, but I I've already um, said where I stand on that one. Um, you, you mentioned El Yunusi. Mikey Johnston started in the, the 2019 final as well. Mm. I just don't think his fitness is quite there to, to start this game. Um Maybe that, that would be a, a curveball. Um, but I certainly think uh, you could argue starting Connor Hazard's a curveball because I know he's played the last two games, but 
ultimately as as a final. Um, and he is a he's a young keeper who hasn't played a lot of football for Celtic, so you could argue that's a curveball. But mm. I mean, other than that, I think Johnston and Clamalla are the only curveballs that I can see, and I, I don't expect either of them. No, I would agree with that. I mean, um, because when we're looking at some of the names coming in, Mikey Johnson is one that's been mentioned time and time again. I would uh, every single day of the week go with uh, El Yunusi before picking Mikey Johnson. He's just working his way back into getting match fit. I think he's a great option on the bench. I also think Lee Griffiths is a great option on there, Paul, because we all know he's not fit enough, but um, given 30 minutes or 25 minutes, we've seen what he can do. We've seen it time and time again this season. Petodre, we've seen it at McDermott Park. Um, he came on in Europe. He's done it at Easter Road. So, you know, he might not have scored against Tibbs, but he certainly made a difference and I think that um, sometimes it's disappointing when we don't have that partnership because we've seen what Eddie and Griff can do up top and with regards to the flip side uh, the flip side of everything that's happened we as fans have protested I mean there's a there's a way of doing it uh, like yourself you've got a channel you've got a platform that you're able to to put your views on and allow people to share their views and we do likewise at a Celtic state of mind but obviously um, people were going to the stadium after the game particularly against Ross County and then there was the organised protest after the Kilmarnock game by the Celtic Trust now in terms of what happens today we're up against um, a championship side even though Kevin Graham says they're a Premier League side and all but league which I still can't figure out in my mind what that means. Um, and hopefully Kevin is watching because I love uh, winding them up. But they are a championship side. Uh, we do have a, a much better group of players than them. And we have been over the line so many times, Paul. And I think that, you know, that seeps into the mentality of, of both us and Hearts. I think we should, and I use the word should, um, you know, in italics because we should win the game a couple of goals to nil at least. However, we know that there's two sides of the Celtic side. And if we get the bad side, if we get the ugly side, then we could really be uh, up against it. What is the, you know, the repercussions of the unthinkable today? What do you think the repercussions are? I mean, I'm going to be sitting in this seat producing the Celtic State of Mind charity weekend or I'm not going anywhere. What do you think the repercussions could be, Paul? I think the repercussions for me and you are, as you said earlier, um, high viewing numbers because negativity is twice as popular as positivity. Isn't it? Um, I think the repercussions for the manager, for the club, I, I don't think there will be any. That's, that's where we're at. Um, the board have said that they will review it in January. So I don't think anything that happens today really is going to change that. Um, it'd be devastating to lose it. But as you say, we've got more than enough quality in the team to, to go and win it and win it comfortably. I think the only danger for us is if we let the first half drift like we've done so many times this season. If we go and get a good start, control the game for the off and get an early goal, I think we should be absolutely fine. Um, I think ultimately we won't, there won't be any repercussions for, in terms of the manager's position, or maybe even more prote protests for the board. Um, they they could happen, I suppose, but I don't think there'll be any changes in, until it's reviewed in January. And to to come back to to the the protests and the board, the whole sack the board thing and and everything like, the board could have prevented that. Um, let's be honest. We've, we've talked about the communication, and ultimately, it was clear for us all to see um, that. We could have been doing a change at some point in that really bad one. And I think if the board had decided to make a change, um, the whole sack, the board protests would never have got off the ground. Um, so I think that was ultimately their um, responsibility due to the, the poor communication and the, the decision mm -hmm. to, to keep Neil Lennon. When it looked like um, we couldn't turn that around, um, yeah. I'm hopeful that we, that we do turn it around and I'm hopeful that um, we all have egg in our face <laughs> at the end of the season, let's be honest. No, you're 100% right, Paul. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to be proved wrong. More than happy. And people can set up the memes and everything else that happens, Paul, when you go out in videos and uh, people wind you up for what you've said and what you've not said. Absolutely, I'll take all of that every day of the week if Neil Lennon can turn this around. But going back to something you did say, I, I do think that come the end of the season, regardless, that whole review of the structure of uh, the club from top to bottom needs to take place. Um, you know, Jim Orr, again, because he'd been through this uh, back in the 90s, talks about sack the board, uh, disband the PLC, and, you know, that's not going to happen. 
Uh, but obviously what we do need to do is we need to communicate our thoughts to the club in relation to where we're going over the next five years and hopefully it will be better than the last five in Europe. Two things uh, to ask you, Paul, and you answered the manager question very diplomatically, I've got to say. Um, what type of manager? What type of manager do you think? I'm not going to ask you for, you know, give me who do you want as, as a Celtic manager. What type of manager are we talking here? Are we talking about someone who's up and coming, someone who's unemployed, someone who's made a name for themselves in England is out of a job? Um, because I think Celtic fans are coming round to the realisation that this Brennan Rogers kind of elite manager might not be where this board is going to be aiming. Yep. I, I think there's. I don't think you can you can debate that that's not where the board's aiming. I think we've seen that with the, the full time appointment in Neil Lennon uh, straight after the cup final. So, I mean, in my opinion, I think Celtic should have the best manager they can possibly get. Um, that might be idealist. It might be unrealistic. I know we can't just go and pluck another Brendan Rodgers out of nowhere. I know that that's that was a unique set of circumstances, if you like, that brought that about. Um, I think we need someone who's modern, who's forward thinking. And again, if we're talking about it in the context of changing the football structure at the club, then it might be someone who works as a, a head coach and is, is willing to work with a director of football or whatever it might be. Um, but I think we have to have someone who is an excellent coach who can organise the team, um, who's tactically versatile. I think that's where football is at now. I think... Um, we all we've all heard this criticism of Neil Lennon in regards to, to tactics and, and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, none of us know what goes on at, at the training ground and and in the tactics meetings and stuff like that. But as I said about the derbies earlier, we've, we've, we've not really come up with anything different in the last three derbies and we're going to have to in January. So I think we have to have the next manager as, mo as modern, forward thinking. I think we have to get away possibly from the, the Celtic man mm. um, recruitment method. I think if we cast our net a bit wider, I understand that there has to be people at the club who understand what Celtic is because it's not your one of the mill football club. They have to understand what it means to, to millions of people. But there can be other people in the club who understand that and who can translate that to a manager. It doesn't have to be the manager himself. It can be players. It can be the assistant manager. There's going to be plenty of people at the club who understand what Celtic is and, and what it means to people. I don't think the manager has to be a Celtic man. Um, so... I can't give you any names and I'm glad you didn't ask me for any, but um, I think that's the the rough profile um, that I would look for as the next manager. Well, Paul, it's uh, that's been an hour. It doesn't seem like an hour. And I think that uh, tells you exactly how much I enjoyed that discussion leading up to what could be a historic day for Celtic. Um, and a season that's been tinged with disappointment uh, throughout, unfortunately for us, but there is still an opportunity to salvage the season. And hopefully we do that. Um, whatever happens, people like Celtic Fans TV will be there every step of the way. So if you're not already doing so, subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Follow this man on Twitter. Um, we have uh, Glasgow is Green coming up next. They had a great interview recently, didn't they? Um, with Kelvin Wilson, which was quite insightful. Glasgow hopefully will be green after 90 minutes uh, in the Scottish Cup final today. All that's left for me to say uh, before we go into a couple of short promo videos for the charities is Paul, Celtic Fans TV. Thank you again for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind, sir. Thank you for having me, Paul. It was a pleasure. Um, and well done again. Great weekend that you've hosted here for wonderful causes. Thank you.